Good afternoon. Uh, if you're in the Eastern time zones, good morning. If, uh, if you're west of here, my name's Chris Crooker. I'm the Assistant Dean for Advancement here at the Whitman School. And we're pleased to welcome you to our first webinar focused on trending topics in business. Today, we're gonna learn about how COVID-19 is impacting the global supply chain and affecting the items that we all buy. We'll first hear a short presentation, then we'll open it up uh, for questions to our presenter. I just would like to let you know that uh, at any point you can type your questions into the chat section of the screen that's in front of you, right on the right-hand side. Patrick Penfield is a professor of practice in supply chain management and director of executive education here at the Whitman School. With over 15 years of industry experience in supply chain management, Professor Penfield has worked for such companies as Johnson & Johnson, Phillips Electronics, and the Raymond Toyota Corporation. He teaches a range of supply chain management courses and executive offerings, including personalized on-demand training for managers. Recently, we're really proud of the fact that Professor Penfield has been widely quoted in the national news media on supply chain management issues surrounding COVID-19. And we're very pleased uh, to have him with us and, and have him take some time today to share his insights with us. Professor Penfield. All right. Thanks, Chris. Appreciate the intro. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Again, as Chris stated, my name is Pat Penfield. So I teach uh, supply chain management here at the Whitman School of uh, Management. I'm also the director of executive education. As Chris had stated, I have a ton of industry experience and I've been in academia for about 17 years now. So I married two kids, uh, live in uh, Baldwin New York, which is outside of uh, Syracuse. Wanted to give you an up-to-date picture of the dome. So many probably know that the uh, dome is under renovation. And so that's kind of what it looks like right now. So I kind of like the, uh, the, the if some of you may know, there's a hard top that they're putting on there. And it kind of looks like a roller coaster at the top, but unfortunately it's not a roller coaster, but it's for aesthetics. All right, yeah, before uh, I get into my presentation, I just wanted to go over our agenda. So today I'm going to kind of give you a little touch upon our SEM program at Whitman, let you know uh, exactly what's going on there. And then I'll talk about global trade and some of the things that are, are happening uh, within uh, uh, the world. And I'll talk about blocks, a Black Swan event and COVID-19. And then uh, we'll get into how it's impacting the supply chain. And then I'll give you some comments on how do we recover and, and improve as far as you know what's going on in today's world. And then I'll conclude my presentation. All right, so some of you may know this, some of you may not, uh, but uh, the uh, Whitman's uh, School Management Supply Chain Management Program is actually the first supply chain program management, or excuse me, first supply chain program in the country. So it started in 1919 through an endowment by a gentleman named H. H. Franklin. So the picture you see on the left or on your right is a picture of the 1927 Franklin series a car. It actually went to auction and was sold for $49,000. So some of you may know this, we have an undergraduate and a graduate program. We also do have a PhD program. I wanna talk a little bit about our graduate program. So uh, we do have a full-time on-campus program and a full-time online program that just started. So if you're interested in either, you know, reach out to Chris for the, uh, the full-time program on campus or reach out to myself on the online program. Uh, so I've given you some links here too. Um, so we're pretty proud of both programs. And so they're, uh, they're awesome. And uh, one of the reasons why we're so proud of our programs is because of our faculty. So we have nine full-time faculty members and they're all outstanding. And so uh, it's, it's uh, kind of a testament to, to our program as far as the, the people that, that uh, work on our faculty and they're just outstanding researchers and uh, just teachers in general. All right, so next I'm gonna talk about COVID-19 and the supply chain. So that's a topic near and dear to my heart and I'm sure for a lot of you, uh, that's that's the same. So just a lot of things going on in the world today. And so, you know, what's interesting is there is these changes and these impacts that are happening on a daily basis. All right, before I talk about COVID-19, I want to talk about our global trade partners. So first and foremost, I want you to know I'm, in, I, I'm a big proponent of globalization. I believe global trade is the way the world should operate. So I, I can't stress that enough. I think that's how we have a, uh, a healthy world when everybody's trading and, and there's no issues and problems. Our top trading partner here in the United States is Mexico, followed by Canada, then China. China, interestingly, was the top uh, trade partner 2018, but because of the Trump administration, the tariffs, they've actually slid to number three. But nonetheless, China is the manufacturer to the world. And so they're a partner that we really rely on in regards to trade. So if you look, just to give you an idea of, of what goes on from a trade standpoint, $4.14 trillion in trade. So it's a lot of trade. So when anything impacts the world, you know, it, it really has a severe impact for everybody. And just so you know, 40% of all U.S. trade is export, while the other 60% is import. 
Um, but again, these are our three top trading partners. So I'll talk a little bit about risk management and great companies usually do some type of risk management, kind of understand what's happening you know, in, in the world. So make sure they kind of protect their operations, especially from a supply chain management standpoint. So there's an organization called uh, Protivity uh, and they actually do this in conjunction with uh, North Carolina State University. And so they do this big uh, survey and they, they talk to Fortune 500 executives and they try to get an, an idea or an understanding. What's a risk for you? And so I've actually have the uh, last uh, two years here. And so you can see the 2020 ranking and the 2019 ranking. So a lot of concerns that executives have, um, but it's interesting when you look at this, there's actually one, one issue or one risk that's missing, and that's pandemics. So pandemics uh, were not on this list. So nobody was actually thinking about this actually being a possibility or actually happening in today's world. So unfortunately, the coronavirus uh, is the 10th worst pandemic in, in history. And so right now we're at 258,000 deaths, 3.7 million people have been infected with this virus. So uh, yeah, just not a good situation. And unfortunately, this is the most up-to-date number uh, from, from today. So when this pandemic happened, uh, it's interesting because we, we didn't expect this. And so the term that a lot of times you'll hear is this thing called black swan event. So a black swan event is when the unpredictable happens and we didn't realize the consequences that would occur. And so this is kind of what's happening with the coronavirus. It's a black swan event. Um, the impact has, has been really adverse. And so we're really trying to understand how do we deal with this because we just don't know and we're struggling as, as a country, as a world, as far as how do we get through this particular situation. So this is an interesting chart. These are the, uh, the stages of a, a business interruption and actually, uh, got this from uh, Melnick Zizden and Raggetts in uh, an Apex magazine. And so they're Michigan State uh, professors. And this, so they kind of talk about this. This is kind of what happens from a business standpoint is this interruption and, and it occurs, right? So from a supply chain standpoint, we're always trying to make sure that we kind of uh, minimize the, the disruptions. So let me walk you through this chart. So if you're a business, you've got output, you're producing goods, everything is good. And then bam, the interruption hits, right? So we've got some type of event that occurs. Could be weather related, be uh, maybe a supply shortage, could be a pandemic, right? So what happens is, is that our output plummets and then our costs go up. And so our costs go up because we're trying to, again, uh, be able to bring the operation back on, online. And so you can see the, the issue here is response. And so the, uh, the longer the response, the more it costs. And so the, the goal is, again, is to get back online to recover, right? So if we can recover, get back to where we were, then uh, you know that that hopefully will, will help our business. The issue is this: is that we always try to minimize the interruption to the best of our abilities, and so this pandemic has really been uh, uh, perplexing to say the least. Just because um, we've just stopped for so long, and, and we're all very frustrated in regards to the, the particular situation. So the goal for anything is again to try to to minimize the, the situation. The, again, the dilemma we have with the coronavirus, it's just not one interruption, it's many interruptions. And so this is what we're seeing within the supply chain. It's in, interrupting our materials, it's interrupting shipping, it's interrupting labor, it's interrupting our, our ability to, to conduct business via government regulations. So we've never seen this type of situation before. So it's, it's really very frustrating if you're in business these days to try to compensate for this particular situation. So unfortunately, this is kind of the way of our world right now is, is dealing with these, these situations and these problems. So I wanna start my story uh, first off uh, in China, right? So this is really kind of how things actually unfolded you know, as, as you know, we're experiencing this particular situation. And it started in Wuhan, uh, China, so many of you know that. And I just wanna talk a little bit about what happens from a supply chain standpoint. So the Chinese New Year uh, usually happens uh, once a year. And so if you're in industry, you know when the Chinese New Year hits. And, uh, and that's because China is the manufacturer to the world. And so if you're a Fortune 500 company or any type of company, you're gonna do business with China. So you're always aware of it. You're always wondering when it's gonna happen. And so one of the things that we try to do is we always try to stock up. So for two weeks in the year, it's very difficult to get product in and out of, of China. In fact, it's very difficult to talk to anybody in China just because of the celebration. So it's a, it's a great celebration. And again, it's one that uh, is, is very important to, to China. So back to the supply chain. So if you're here in the United States, you're gonna stock up and you're gonna have inventory again to kind of protect against this, uh, protect of the celebration, right? We wanna make sure that we have hopefully enough product to be able to, uh, to meet our needs. 
So when the Chinese New Year ended, uh, we started to see some interesting things happen. Uh, and so first and foremost, we saw that um, shipping actually started to slow down pretty significantly. Uh, so there were 350,000 containers that were removed from global trade. So what does that mean? That means um, that a lot of these ships didn't have um, containers on them. It was TEUs, 20 foot containers. One cargo ship um, that, I, that I researched only had 20,000 um, 20, TEUs. It, was, uh, it carries 20,000 TEUs. It was only 35% full. So you can see that there were a lot of ships that were coming over to the United States um, that um, were empty for the most part. Not only that, but we also saw that cargo volume was starting to drop. So the LA port is where a lot of um, um, actual goods come from China or actually are shipped to, to the United States through the LA port. Not only that, we started to see some other things that were a little alarming. So CNBC had a report that talked about um, what was going on for Chinese businesses and only 30% of Chinese businesses resumed production in, in February, in the whole month of February, which is kind of scary. Again, uh, what does that mean? Well, 60% of the GDP actually comes from those, 30% uh, of those uh, companies. So if you're a U.S. company and you have a, a, a Chinese supplier, you're very concerned about what's going on from a situational standpoint. So you want to make sure that hopefully you have enough product to be able to take care of your needs. And that was our dilemma is that, you know, we were hearing uh, things that were going on in China. We heard about the coronavirus. Uh, we were concerned that it might come here, but we were, you know, we, we thought that that was in the case um, that, you know, we should be fine. And then March hit, right? And so we started to see some issues and problems. Um, one other thing that occurred from a, a logistics standpoint was the Trump travel ban, right? So he wanted to prevent people from China to coming to the United States. And so uh, that's what he did. He enacted that ban. But unfortunately, when he did that, um, it also caused an issue from a, uh, a logistics standpoint. So 50% of the world's air cargo is actually carrying the bellies of planes. So some of you may know that, some of you may not know that. So if you think about this, if you ban travel from China to the United States, then those planes are not coming, right? So if you're an airline, you're gonna cancel those, those planes. But unfortunately, if you're a company reliant on those airlines and you can't get your freight to the United States, this is a horrific situation, right? So now you've got to think of another way uh, of, of getting your goods um, to the United States. And I think that's the one thing in a supply chain management is that we're problem solvers, right? We're always trying to figure out, okay, when a situation happens, how do we react fast enough to make sure that we get what we need, you know, from a, from a product standpoint. All right, back to March. So March hits and uh, China seems to be recovering from the coronavirus and we start to see that manufacturer actually is ramping up. But unfortunately here in the United States, things are starting to slow down. So again, we're connected, you know, we're connected with the world specifically with, with China. And so, you know, we started to see that government, uh, the, the um, state governments, county governments, the federal government started to kind of lock down in regards to what we're doing from a business standpoint, right? So a lot of us are stay at home and shelter. Um, a lot of us, you know, again, uh, have um, uh, things that are actually preventing us from, from doing stuff. A lot of companies are not working, and so it's really caused a lot of issues and problems. So, from an unemployment standpoint, this is probably the most people we've seen unemployed in uh, since the Great Depression, uh, which which is very sad. In addition to that, we also noticed that port activity was plummeting again, right? So, uh, this is again uh, based off of last year's numbers. So, 26, 27, 28 percent. So here it's the opposite situation. Now in the U.S., we we don't need those products, and so we're, we're not ordering stuff. So again, the supply chain is really getting kind of stressed. So it's stressed on our end. It's also stressed on our partners' ends in regards to you know what they're able to do and how they're able to do. It. So one of the things that um, that I I've seen through this this whole uh, situation is this this imbalance uh, versus uh, demand and supply. And so ideally, in, in the supply chain, we always want to make sure that we have enough materials to meet whatever our demand is. In this particular situation, it's been very difficult to be able to do that. And the issue is the disruptions that are happening throughout the supply chain. So this is one of those things that we've never seen before. And it's it's interesting uh, and, and sad at the same time, right? So we're, I'm intrigued as, as a person in academia of, of these situations, these problems, and kind of trying to understand what companies are trying to, to do to, uh, to be able to get through these situations. So I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, some of the demand issues and some of the supply issues uh, that we're seeing in uh, today's world. All right, so the first uh, one, uh, demand with retailers, right? It's plummeted. It's uh, horrific. This is a real bad situation if you're a retailer these days. You know, they've been shut down since uh, probably the end of February. Um, and this is interesting. This is global retail sales have been down almost 10% uh, in 2020. 
recently. That's $2.1 trillion, uh, which if you think about that's just a, that's mind numbing number to think about from a retail standpoint. So this was uh, recently in the news where Kohl's, one of uh, the department stores here in the United States, canceled $100 million in orders with uh, Korean, Korean uh, textile firms. Unbelievable, right? So you would think, you know, this is this is crazy when you, when you hear something like that. Um, not only for Kohl's, but also for their suppliers, right? So if you're a supplier and you're really uh, dependent on Kohl's orders and they decide, hey, we're going to cancel this, this is just unbelievable, right? I mean, how do you react to something like that? You really can't. It, it is a black swan event. It's one of those situations where, again, um, you know, you're, you're really uh, you're going to be desperate. And that's kind of what happened. There was a lot of um, uh, pushback with Kohl's and a lot of bad publicity. And not only that, but now we're starting to see bankruptcies. And I just saw another one before came on the air uh, today. So uh, these are one, some ones that you know, and there's going to be more. And that's the unfortunate thing, but expect to see this with retailers. A lot of our retailers, especially from a, um, a financial st uh, standpoint, weren't very strong to begin with. And now when you have this particular pandemic, it's really exasperating the whole situation. And now we're going to see uh, more and more of these retailers shut down. So the longer this plays out where stores are not able to open, um, then we're going to have issues and problems. So there have been some openings that are going on in the United States, but the, the dilemma uh, that we have now is that people are scared you know, to shop. And so this is another situation that, uh, that we're looking at and seeing. All right, then we've got the opposite. So this term called panic buying, which I had never heard of before this incident happened, right? So I, I honestly, I fell into this particular situation too. So this gentleman right here with all the toilet paper, I actually saw that happen and it kind of alarmed me. And so what did I do? Uh, I think it's just human instinct. I went and bought two packs because I was like, well, that guy's buying a whole cartload of, of toilet paper. I better protect my my family. And, and it was very strange, right? So you wouldn't expect that to be the one product that everybody you know decides to buy. But if I, I did a little research because I was I was really intrigued by this. And I was wondering, why this product? And I found in other situations, this seems to be the product that goes first in, in these types of uh, situations, pandemics, weather events, things of that nature. Not only toilet paper, uh, but we saw this huge run in hand sanitizer. So it's very difficult to get hand sanitizers. Thankfully, a lot of our distillers and breweries are starting to make that for us. So it seems like we're, we've been able to recover what's hand sanitizers and toilet paper. But disinfecting wipes, good luck trying to find some of those. Uh, those are very difficult. I had, um, I've been talking about this in the press a lot, and I actually had a conversation with the Vice President of Supply Chain Planning at Clorox. So he reached out to me and we had a conversation and it was very interesting. And he wanted to just talk about the situation uh, because he wanted to make sure that I kind of understood what was going on from their, their uh, vantage point as, as a supply chain professionals. So we talked and uh, this is the first thing that, that really kind of um, I thought was very interesting. He knew the first part of January that there was going to be a big issue here in the United States. And I'd asked him that. I said, how did you know that? And he goes, well, we have global operations. And we knew things were happening in China, some, some things that were really kind of just you know, overwhelming us from a demand standpoint. And I'm going, wow, that is crazy. And he goes, you know what, Pat, what I did is I went to my CFO. I talked about adding more inventory and he was fine with that because that was gonna impact his working capital. But he said, you know, this makes sense. And he could explain it to, to the investors and, and to uh, upper management about why he was doing what he did. Thankfully he did, but unfortunately, he didn't put enough inventory in, into the process. So they had a 500% increase in demand. In fact, their president was on, I think, uh, Yahoo Finance and kind of talked about this particular situation, what was going on. So they're making 20 million canisters a month. So if you think about that, that's a huge leap from what they were doing before. And so he was telling me, Pat, the issue is our capacity. And it wasn't really about ingredients. It was about, we can't make the stuff fast enough. In fact, he said, Pat, talked to one big box retailer. They told us they brought a pallet onto the floor in 35 seconds that pallet was gone. So just to give you an idea of the pressure that's happening from a demand standpoint uh, with, uh, with Clorox. And so this is kind of their, their dilemma. This is the, the situation. So we, we talked more and, uh, you know, he was telling me these other stories, which I thought were, were very fascinating. And he said, you know, we even have, we, we've heard from some of our, our supermarket customers that customers are actually in the back of the receiving areas waiting for trucks to come. And when the trucks come, they ask the drivers, hey, what do you have on the truck? And if they tell them Clorox, they go right into the store, back to where, uh, where they bring product out 
and they grab stuff uh, before it actually hits the floor, if you can believe that or not. So it, it was kind of crazy. So these uh, supermarket uh, supermarkets actually had to put some processes in place to prevent that from happening. So when I was uh, talking to the, uh, the VP, uh, we also talked about what, what they were doing in order to be able to meet demand. So one of the things that they're, they're looking at is just adding different lines. And he told me, Pat, we're adding lines in May and June and August. The problem is, is they're highly automated. And I, I talked about lead times with equipment. He says, yeah, the lead times are long, but our suppliers are accelerating um, you know, their ability to actually use this equipment for us. And because they are, we're going to be able to get stuff online. And he was very hopeful that they would have product on the shelf in June or July. So that, that was his goal. That was striving to do. When we left the conversation, this is one thing he told me. He goes, Pat, this category is growing significantly. It's changed forever. So what he meant by that is that this is going to be a staple for Clorox in addition to, um, to, to us as far as uh, consumers go. Another uh, company that's really uh, seen a lot of demand is Amazon, right? So honestly, I'm, I'm very thankful for Amazon. And I'll tell you why. It's because, you know, their ability to be able to ship anything that we need, that we want, especially during a, a situation like that. If we didn't have the Amazons of the world, this would be a really difficult situation for us, you know, being able to get product. So interesting, right? So um, this, when you see the sales increase, you're like, wow, this is fantastic. It's like a 26, 27% increase in sales. So in your mind, you're probably thinking, oh, they're, they're doing fantastic. And, and I'm sure a lot of us thought that also. Uh, Jeff Bezos was, uh, was actually reporting on, on his sales increases. And he talked about how operating income decreased. And people were like, what do you mean it decreased? And he says, well, we've been spending so much on COVID, on fighting COVID within our warehouses and, and our offices and, and, and with our, our, our people that deliver our product, that it's actually impact us adversely. So even though their sales have gone up 26%, they actually saw a, a decrease in, in their actual uh, operating income. So this is some of the things that you don't hear about or, or see, but this is truly something that a lot of companies are struggling with right now, is how do we make sure that our operations can handle um, this particular pandemic? Supply parts. So this is interesting. So um, 25 car assembly plants here in the United States closed on March 18th. And so now they're talking about restarting. And so the goal is to, to start up May uh, 18th. Here's your situation. So if you're a car manufacturer, you have these assembly plants, very costly, very expensive. Every day they're down, it's costing those uh, automobile manufacturers millions of dollars. And so, you know, this is unfortunate. So this is, again, their kind of their dilemma is they were unable to run these factories because a lot of the labor that was producing these cars were sick. And so, unfortunately, they had to shut down. And so they worked with the unions and, and you know, these various facilities, and they talked about, okay, here's what we're going to do to kind of change the operation, make it so that our, our workers are safe. In the meantime, um, they've been shut down. They haven't been ordering parts. So Mexico actually hasn't been hit as hard as we've been hit here in the United States. This is the, the, the horrible thing about this disease is that it's traveling, it's going in waves. So even though uh, we're seeing the, the issues right now, um, well, there's other countries that haven't really been impacted as adversely as we have. And so here's, here's our problem. So now we're ready, we wanna operate, we wanna open up these, uh, these factories, get these people working, but now Mexico is, is kind of stressed. And so unfortunately their hospital system, it's, it's a government managed hospital system, not the best in the world. I mean, they're, they're great doctors, great nurses, I'm sure great people. It's just the system itself isn't very strong in regards to, to handling mass amounts of sick people. It's, it's very difficult, very arduous for them to be able to do that. So they're very concerned and they're very worried about this particular situation. So, um, you know, we're ready to start, Canada's ready to, to do some things too. But Mexico, that's the, the question. Can they restart? Can they get parts to uh, these car manufacturers? We'll have to wait and see. I believe that they're saying, hey, they think they can. But again, we just don't know about this uh, just because of the coronavirus. Meatpacking, right? So you've heard a lot of this in, uh, in today's world. And so unfortunately, this is some of the stuff that we've seen. 4,400 workers have tested positive. So in the meatpacking industry, it's kind of an interesting situation. So you have these huge facilities and they're slaughtering tens of thousands of animals. And so, you know, it's huge amounts and they're massive monster uh, facilities. The unfortunate thing is when you look at these facilities, the people are all next to each other. You can see here, this is a, a picture that, that I found of, of what some of these meatpacking companies are doing in regards to trying to protect their workers. So this is some of the PPE that they're using. 
in my own estimate, I'm not sure if that really is going to be able to protect all of them. Uh, but unfortunately, this is all they have right now. So this is the other dilemma is PPE is not something that we have a huge abundance of. And so most of that stuff's going to the frontline workers, the hospitals, the nurses, the doctors. So your poor meat packers, they unfortunately don't have you know, the tools they need in order to, to feel safe about what they're doing. So unfortunately, they've been forced back to work through uh, the federal government. And so, you know, this is kind of the situation that, that they're in. And so and the other dilemma that they face is this, is that one in three plants have very high rates of, of COVID. And so this is the other situation is that you've got a lot of exposure that's going on to these workers. Maybe not in the, in the factories, but outside of the factories. And so unfortunately they can bring this, this disease is so contagious um, that it's, it's very difficult to, to protect you know, workers unless you really have good PPE equipment. I'll give you another example. There was uh, this happened in Washington State, and this occurred, I think, in um, the second week of March. There was a choir group at this church, and so there was about a hundred, I think, a hundred members in this in this choir. And so the, uh, the the person that runs the choir decided that he was going to have practice, and so he emailed all the choir groups and says, "I know the pandemic's going on in Washington, but let's have practice." And so sixty of them came uh, to to actually practice. Uh, after that, a week later, forty five of them contracted COVID. Um, which is just mind boggling. And so they, they did some investigations. They found out just from people talking that uh, you would be able to, or singing, you'd be able to actually get COVID. All right, so how do we recover? How do we improve? Yeah, this is a complex situation, um, but I can tell you this, I know as a supply chain professional, we're up for the challenge, right? I think this is the, you know, kind of what we live for. You know, this is kind of something that, that uh, most of us supply chain professionals are very good at doing, right? Is, is resolving these problems and situations. This is a complex problem. This is something that's very difficult and very hard to actually get through. So when I was looking at this, I, I decided to kind of look at four ways that, that I would focus on if I were a business. And, and first and foremost is just the, the business itself. And then secondly is our supply base and trying to understand, you know, how do we work with them, you know, especially if it's a global supply base. And then the people within our facilities and then the processes, right? These are all things that we have to kind of think about and uh, to protect the business uh, and, and what we do. All right, so first and foremost is survival, right? So when you're in business, this is really what we're trying to do these days, right, is, is be able to survive. I'd like to tell you that everybody's gonna come out of this um, you know, without any damage, but unfortunately, I think in the next three months, you're gonna see a lot of bankruptcies happen. And this is unfortunate, uh, especially in the service sector, you know, with restaurants and hotels, um, any hospitality type business um, is, is really gonna be uh, really impacted adversely. So some of you may have seen uh, the airline um, industry, what's going on there and how Warren Buffett decided that actually he was going to divest himself of, of airline stock. The reason why he decided to do that is he knew that those airlines aren't going to be, be making any money in the next three to four years. They're going to have to borrow as much as they possibly can just to stay in business. So there's not going to be a lot of revenue or a lot of profits actually coming from those businesses. So the U.S. government's kind of stepped in. And so um, we have programs. And there's a lot of money that's being pumped into the system. Uh, the dilemma is this is how much more money can we pump in there um, before we have start to have some issues in regards to a debt. And so, and again, inflation. And so these are some other things that we have to think about from a macro standpoint. But we need the government to kind of step in and help with these programs uh, for some of these businesses, especially uh, small businesses. This is really going to be a very difficult situation. So from a business standpoint, you have to change. Uh, this is really kind of the situation that you're in these days. So. If you're not changing right now, you may not be in business, right? So first and foremost, if you're a store, you gotta figure out how do I do this online stuff? You know, how do I become this omni-channel? How do I make it so I'm able to do that? Some companies have been already set up for that. So we've already talked about Amazon, but there's other companies, right? Um, so again, how do you make it so it's easy for people to do business with you from an online standpoint? Bulk versus individual packing. This is something that's impacting the food industry horrifically. So the companies that actually can do individual packing, they're actually doing fine. They're doing really well because they're supplying supermarkets. The, the food companies that are doing the bulk stuff where they ship it to hospitality or to colleges and universities or to concessions, different story, right? So they're kind of stuck. The reason why they're stuck is the packaging. They just don't have the right packaging. They don't have the right processes to be able to do this individual packaging. So they kind of have to think about how do we change in order to be able to hopefully meet that demand. And then you got to diversify, diversify what you sell, right? So what does the market want right now? And this is kind of, again, what good entrepreneurs do is they figure out, hey, this is, this is, 
you have to look at this as hopefully as an opportunity and uh, be able to you know, change your business model. There uh, is another option, and this is where you possibly could go offline. I've actually seen this in the 2008 recession when I was doing some uh, research with hardwood sawmills. So I, I found that these small hardwood sawmills, uh, when the recession hit, they were devastated. And so instead of actually shutting down um, or going out of business or going bankrupt, they just went offline. They said, you know, we'll shut down for a year, come back when things are better. And that's kind of what happened. Key thing is cash, right? And so cash is very key. So a lot of my colleagues, they do a lot of uh, you know, studying and modeling uh, in, in this particular situation from a financial standpoint. So that's one of the things that we're really good at here at Syracuse, especially supply chain finance. This is really kind of key. Cash is king or queen, right? So if you've got cash, you can survive. If you don't have cash, it's very difficult to stay in business. All right, next we want to look at our supply base, and this is really kind of key. And I'm a big proponent of this. I think this is a very smart for companies to do is kind of map out your supply base, map out your suppliers, map out your logistics suppliers, map out your subcontractors, understand who you're doing business with. This is really kind of key. You want to also understand how are they doing financially and how are they being impacted by the coronavirus? So if we know this, then this can kind of help us understand how we can take the right measures and the right actions if something bad happens. So tooling is a big issue, especially if you're working with suppliers. So tooling is, is what we need in order to make things. So you have to kind of understand, you know, who has your tooling, where is it, has it been tagged? So if a tooling supplier or, or supplier goes bankrupt and you haven't tagged your tooling, you could lose your tooling. So the, you know, the authorities won't let you into their factory unless there's a tag stating that's your property. And so this is one of those things that you have to think about right now. So we've got to look at our supply base and we've got to figure out who our primary, secondary, tertiary suppliers are. And that's that's three levels down. Why? Because there's issues, right? So, you know, all over the world, we're going to have problems and situations. The ideal situation is if we're dual source from different areas of the world. If we are, then that's going to hopefully protect our business. But this is what we have to think about. The other thing that smart companies are doing is setting up these crisis teams is when there's a situation where you can't get product, you got to think of another way. So I'll give you a great example. So McDonald's in Canada, they can't get meat. So, you know, they're, they're accustomed to get it from a local supplier. So now they've got to go someplace else in the world and uh, be able to, to get that meat. So Wendy's is, is in a situation like this right now too uh, with ground beef. Uh, because of the meatpacking industry's situations and issues, there's this hole within the supply chain. Nobody can get meat you know, unless you find it someplace else globally. Uh, and so this is kind of the dilemma. But if you have a crisis team, a lot of times you can react and, and fix things. GM actually did this in the 2008 recession. So they were very concerned about their supply base. In fact, they would call their suppliers on a daily basis to make sure they were still in business. And then if something bad happened, they actually had a crisis SWAT team go to the supplier, get what they need, help the suppliers sometimes get up and running. Sometimes they would give cash to the suppliers just to hopefully make sure that they're able to operate. So this is some of the stuff that you have to do now because we're at the cusp of some situations about to happen from a bankruptcy standpoint, very close. If we can get back into business, it may not be as bad. My own humble opinion, I don't think that's probably going to happen for another month or so where we're actually going to be hopefully moving in the right direction. I think there's still some time where uh, it's going to be very difficult for a lot of businesses uh, to, to stay in business. All right, people. Now, I get this question a lot is how can you guarantee me 100% that I will not be infected by the coronavirus if I go to work? This is what you have to do. This is the only way that I could think of that that would allow you to be able to do this. You literally have to wear a hazmat suit to work. You have to wear a hazmat suit to work. And then when you're done with your shift or done with your work, you got to go into decontamination chamber. And that's just because of the coronavirus could actually be on your hazmat suit. And then you actually have to wear that hazmat suit home. And then hopefully you might have another decontamination chamber <laughs> at your house. So this is unfortunate, but this is how deadly this virus is. It's, it stays on things for you know, at least 24 hours. So this is kind of our dilemma, but the unfortunate thing is companies can't afford this, right? This would be impossible to do. It's actually interesting. I've actually seen some, um, some things going on in the world. In Vietnam, they actually have some kind of uh, decontamination chamber that they're using. I'm not sure, again, how, uh, how, how good it is, but you can see people are, are starting to think outside the box in regards to how to react to this coronavirus. All right, so what would you actually do? So here's here's what I think has to happen, is you gotta have a responsible person. So I'm always a big proponent. There has to be a focal point to be able to actually kind of drive uh, this particular situation. Interestingly, the Houston Texans, this is the first organization I've heard doing this, actually hired a facility hygiene coordinator. 
you know, a, a US football team decided to do this now. And 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 I know why, right? Because they're, you know, they're concerned about the football season, right? They're concerned about tickets and they're concerned about people being able to go to the games. So, you know, I think that's not a bad thing. If you can't hire somebody, then maybe your health and safety person has to become that facility hygiene coordinator. They have got to be that person. And I do believe you need a committee approach, right? So it's just not up to that person to make sure things work. You need a committee in your company to get together and kind of talk about this. And I think you're, you're going to have what I call front door requirements is, you know, we're going to have a single entry and exit. Um, we're going to have people monitoring the doors. Um, we're going to make sure that all office and floor people go through the same entrance. They got to take their temperature. The issue is this is this asymptomatic person, right? So that's that person that doesn't have a temperature that's sick, but you don't know. And this is the, the other cruel thing about this virus is that there are a lot of these people walking around today. And unfortunately, these asymptomatic people can infect people and they can get the, the actual symptoms, which is, which is kind of sad. That I don't have an answer for you. I think that one is something I'll talk a little bit about with uh, testing in a minute. But those people coming through your door, this is going to be tough. I'll talk a little bit about the process and as far as what we can do to hopefully protect us against those, those people. And this is the other thing with people are sick. They got to stay home. They have to stay home. This is really kind of critical for this to work. And they've got to notify people, notify people on the committee or the, the hygiene coordinator that this is what's going on. Right? So we want to make sure that we take the right steps. Testing the ideal situation is if we could test employees right at the front door. And if we know before they even come into the facility, if they're sick or not, unfortunately, that's not going to happen right now. I, I don't know when that'll occur. We're, we're having a hard enough time trying to just test people in general. Right? And the so testing is getting faster. The ideal situation for us is if we could test people before they came in the door, then we would know without with certainty that these people are sick or not. The other thing is tracking, right? So we've got to get better here in the United States in regards to doing that is people that have come in contact with infected individuals. This is the other dilemma is that you could become infected, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you will show the symptoms for two to 10 days. So, you know, if we're not aware of this particular situation, especially from a business standpoint, this is again, could open us up to some severe liabilities. Some other things that that would be good to do also is testing for antibodies to find out, you know, which of our employees has some type of immunity. So this might mean that we may not have to test them uh, if they come through the front door or test them on a regular base, basis. And then lastly um, is a vaccine, right? So we urgently need that. The sooner we get a vaccine, the better the uh, I think we will be as a labor force. You know, at least we'll have some assurance that we have some protection against this this virus. All right, let's talk about the process. This is probably what concerns me the most within companies. I'm not sure how well people are looking at this right now, and I'm very concerned. And you can see there's a picture here of some guest workers that are working on a farm. So these guest workers, a lot of times they come up from Mexico, right? So if you remember, I was talking about this earlier, how we've got guest workers that, that we're dealing with from Mexico. And Mexico really hasn't seen a huge wave yet of the coronavirus. When they come up, this could be a different situation, especially here in central New York. We're very dependent on our guest workers to come up and help us pick our fruits and vegetables. What you may know, what you may not know, is we house these people too, and, and they're housed in, in cramped quarters. This is really difficult. If you get one person that's sick, um, you're going to have a bad situation. We actually had an incident happen yesterday in uh, Madison County. It was a hyponics uh, facility, so they grow vegetables and fruits. And I think there's over 100 employees because it's close quarters that have been infected with the coronavirus. This is what absolutely scares me in the summer is this particular situation. But if we have the right PPE, that's the protective uh, you know, equipment for these individuals. Yeah, this this hopefully will, will make make sense. The other thing we have to look at is interaction points. You know, where where are the touches happening? When do we hand off stuff? Um, and so if we have the right PPE, kind of understand this process, make sure that we put that discipline in of, of the six feet, uh, you know, with the um, social distancing. That, that'll, uh, again, be very paramount to the success of, of making sure the process is secure. Safety, it, it's, it's got to be key. So this is, again, my big concern. A lot of these guest workers, when they come to the United States, they don't make a lot of money. And so I'm just I'm concerned that our farmers, hopefully, are taking the right steps to protect these people. So avoidance of distance. If we can do this, if we can set up these PPE barriers within the process, if we can make sure people have the right equipment, if we can have the, the disinfecting which is absolutely key, right? So we've got to make sure people are, are, are disinfecting the process as much as they possibly can. All right, so uh, to conclude my, my presentation, just want to talk a little bit about learning, right? So this is a horrible situation that we're in, and it's going to continue probably, I hate to say it, probably for the next year. 
know, this is kind of our life. But, you know, we can learn from this. And this is really what we have to do is learn, you know, what did we do wrong? And, you know, the first thing that probably pops up to my mind is just our government response, not just the federal government, but our states, our counties, our cities, you know, how are we collectively working together when these particular situations happen? This is the other thing that nobody is really talking about is these different supply chains within these different organizations. We can't see what's going on with these different states. We don't know who has all the ventilators. We don't know who has all the respirators. We don't know who has all the PPE equipment. It would be awesome if we could see that. And it would be great that if we could move that material when it's needed in these different areas of, of the country. I, I guess if anything, the saving grace with the coronavirus, it's not attacking everybody all at once, right? So it's kind of moving, I think, in waves. And so if we are able to move that, that material with those situations, it could help immensely. We could really hopefully be able to get through these situations fast. The other thing is stockpiles. I think this is really kind of critical and, and key is to understand what do we have to stockpile to make sure that we're secure in the future from the next pandemic. If you're a company, you got to think about your response. A lot of companies, believe it or not, have some type of recovery plans in place, but nothing that has to do with pandemics. I don't think we've ever thought about that before. So we got to think about our demand. We got to think about our suppliers. We got to think about our people. We got to think about our processes, right? So this is unfortunate if you're a new business, if you're a small business, a small restaurant that just opened up last month, what a horrific situation that you're in, right? So this is unfortunate, but this is our, our world right now. So please remember, there will be more pandemics, there will be more catastrophes in the future. So we have to prepare. We've got to make sure that hopefully we are able to be in good shape when this, this happens again. All right, that's the end of my, my presentation. I want to thank you all for, for attending and I, I appreciate you uh, hopefully you gained something. And uh, right now, I'll take some questions if anybody has any. Awesome. Thanks so much, Professor Penfield. Uh, Carrie Howell is also uh, joining us here. She's our Director of Communications and Media Relations at the Whitman School. Carrie, looks like we've been getting some, some good thought-provoking questions in response to an amazing presentation. So do you want to you wanna feed, the, feed a couple of those to Professor Penfield? Absolutely. Um... Yeah, so Gilbert Levine is asking, what about fruits and vegetables, Pat? I know we talked about meat and meat packing and cleaning supplies, but he's thinking about the harvesting and the labor force, a little bit about what you were talking about just a few minutes ago. Specifically, what percentage is imported from Mexico and Central South America? What about crops in the U.S.? Like, what can we expect with that? Yeah, Gilbert, great question. I think the, the problem that... Uh see in the foreseeable future is you're going to see less variety of things. So a lot of stuff, um, here's here's the, the other situation. Believe it or not, a lot of farmers are destroying a lot of their produce and, and vegetables and they're remulching it into their, into their farmlands. Part of it is because they can't pick it and they can't get it through the distribution process, right? So this is another uh, fail that we have within our supply chains. So uh, Gilbert, I think what you're going to see, again, I don't have percentages, I think what will happen probably in the next six months, you're going to see less variety of fruits and vegetables. You will see prices go up because uh, there will be less of them. You're going to see farmers, farmers struggle to pick, you know, especially if they're relying on those guest workers from Mexico. And again, my big concern is, um, is hopefully they're healthy when they come. This is the other cruel dilemma of the situation. So let's say Mexico you know, gets hit with the, the coronavirus as, as much as we've been hit here, and we're through ours and Mexico's is still going through theirs. And then we have guest workers that are sick. They could reinfect our, our, our population. And I'm sure a lot of our government officials are thinking about this, right? Is that how do we again, how do we protect uh, the food supply chain, specifically uh, fruits and produce? So Gilbert, there'll be less. Um, I think probably for the next year, prices are going to go up. Uh, the best thing is if you can is to buy locally. I think from an import standpoint, you're going to see less of that. This is the other thing I've been seeing too is a lot of countries are kind of protecting their food supply chains. So they're not shipping as much as they normally do, which is kind of interesting, right? So again, proponent of globalization, it's the way the world moves. When you stop doing things like that, that is not a good situation. Great, and um, Pat, another question actually comes from someone who's on the phone, um, Janice Harvey. She is, she works at, in the ER. She's an administrator for all the ER docs at Upstate. And she is wondering if you can comment on the idea that grocery stores actually contributed to some of the panic buying and the hoarding that we were seeing? I, I think uh, to a certain extent they did. I, I think um, this is uh, what they could have done faster is probably limit how much people were, were buying. So I, I think Janice, you're, you're onto something. Um, could they have enacted um, certain protocols to prevent the, the panic buying? Absolutely. 
So I think I think they were also taken off guard in the beginning in regards to you know, uh, what people were buying. And so uh, once this started to unfold, then they realized that this was severely impacting their supply chain and they weren't able to uh, to get enough product to put on the shelves. So I, I have seen some of the retailers kind of cut back and then limit what you can purchase. And so I think that's a good way to kind of manage the, the panic buying. But you're right. I think there was probably a situation that happened in the beginning where it was first come, first serve. You get what, whatever you can, and um, you know, good for you. And and I think uh, you know a lot of these retailers you know, were benefiting from this. But I think the other thing is is with panic buying is, is you have to remember this is it's it's going to be a surge, right? So you're going to buy a lot of stuff. Eventually, those people are going to stop buying that product. They're going to stop buying that toilet paper. So it will eventually come back and hurt these these stores eventually, just because you know you have too much of this stuff and you've got to use up what you got. Great. And uh, the next question comes from Ryan Green, and this is a management question, Pat. When dealing with interruptions or a black swan event like COVID, how should supply chain managers best go about obtaining reliable, factual information to inform their recovery strategies? That's a great question. So I'm going to go back to my uh, the individual I talked about at Clorox. So a lot of times in the supply chain, we know things that before other people know. Just just because of interacting with our suppliers in, in different parts of the world. So I think if if you have the ability and you have suppliers in different parts of, of the world, you're going to kind of know about these things when, when they happen, right? That these these things are occurring and it potentially can impact us. I think the, the, the right approach is, again, having some type of risk assessment plan, right? And this is what a lot of companies will do is a disaster recovery plan. And I would hope that you know companies are updating it now for pandemics, right? So talk about, hey, if a pandemic hits, here's what we're going to do. This is the stuff that we're going to enact. So I think that's something that has to happen is again, is trying to talk to people globally, especially when pandemics are happening, especially your suppliers. A lot of times we know in the supply chain when things are occurring. And then, you know, right now is to kind of talk about this particular situation and plan for the next pandemic, you know, based off of what we've learned. So I think if you can do that, I think that helps immensely. Great. Um, okay, question now from Jamie Nicolosi wants to know what you think the long-term impact will be on the global supply chain. So will countries and companies be looking for additional geographic sources now for their supplies and materials, or, or will they even seek to manufacture on their own? Yeah, that's a great question. I think short-term, you're probably gonna see more companies try to get as much as they can domestically. The problem is, is, is there are certain industries that are in certain parts of the world. You'll never ever be able to produce that domestically, like uh, some of our electronics. Um, China is the manufacturer of the world. China is also the electronics capital of the world. So some of that stuff will never come back, right? So now we've got to figure out, okay, how do we deal with that? But I think what probably will occur is com countries will look domestically. Um, there's going to be barriers. Um, uh, people are going to be probably told you know, domestically, hey, buy domestic just based on what's going on. And I think it's probably going to take about a year, year and a half before things start to loosen up. Um, one of the things that I have been seeing is just travel in general. You know, as companies are um, one one person I was talking to about travel um, was was basically stated or uh, was basically given an edict from their management that they can't travel till 2021, March of 2021. So just to give you an idea, I think you'll see again more stuff happen domestically. Um, you'll source when you have to. I think the other thing from a sourcing strategy uh, standpoint is to dual source, but maybe in different regions of the world. So we're not going to just source in China. We may source uh, someplace else, maybe in Mexico, and then make sure that we're covered both ways. So if something like a pandemic hits again, you know, we've got two different options. And I think that that may not be a bad approach just because of weather events that are happening these days, too. So I think that's probably what you'll see more companies do. Yeah, and this is kind of a follow up question to that. Um, Joshua Vaughn was asking about the supplier's supplier. And do you think companies will return to a full just in time inventory model? That's a great question. So the supplier is a tier two supplier. So let's let, let's talk about the just in time model. I think in a pandemic, now this is again as supply chain professionals, we have to realize the just in time model is not going to go away, right? So um, Companies right now, they're probably stocking up and they're probably uh, being very lenient in regards to inventory. Once the pandemic subsides, and it will, it eventually will go away. Trust me when I say that. Then you'll see more pressure on companies to reduce um, their inventory and get back to that just-in-time model. So I think what we have to do as supply chain professionals 
because we have to watch when these situations are about to happen. And then we've got to lay that inventory in, right? So we've got to protect our, our company, protect our business. And that's really what, you know, I think very good supply chain professionals do is, is looking at the, doing the environmental scanning. And then when something happens is reacting as quick as you possibly can to protect the business. And I think if you can do that, that's going to help immensely. Um, if you're again on a situation where um, you're reacting late, then you're going to have problems. Now, if you're dealing with tier two suppliers, so your tier one suppliers, your immediate supplier, your tier two suppliers, your supplier supplier. Yeah, you may have to go and, and kind of figure out what's happening there so that there is no disruption within your supply chain and talk to your tier one supplier and see what they're doing. Um, the other issue you might have is that tier three supplier. So the supplier supplier, right? So again, how do you ensure that they're able to produce what they need in order to make sure that you get what you want? So I see this more from a supplier development situation where the big companies will be able to kind of figure out from a supplier mapping standpoint who's doing what and then kind of protect the business uh, when situations occur. And again, that's usually laying in inventory, but just in time, we'll come back. It will, and that's just because inventory costs money. All right. So Heather Colby is looking ahead. She's a planner like me. She wants to know what you see for limits and products that are coming to the U.S. from China for back to school and seasonal and holiday items. All right, so I think the, the big thing still is going to be these uh, desanitizing wipes. I think that's going to be your big issue for one product that's going to be difficult to, to get, uh, especially before back to school. I think they'll be on the shelves in June, July, but I just think they'll be wiped out pretty quick and pretty fast. I think for the most part, um, everything else, um, I, I think you should see, you know, it really all depends on what's going on with the pandemic. You know, if we have um, a, uh, a second wave of this pandemic, it's going to impact a lot of things that we you know, and it'll come back to the same things that we're having issues with right now, meat, um, fruits and vegetables. Um, it could impact us in regards to um, some of the stuff that we get from China. We're very fortunate that this pandemic actually didn't happen in the fourth quarter. If it would have happened in the fourth quarter, this would have been a disaster economically for everybody. Um, and actually, and again, if, if you had to time this, this is probably when you'd want to time it is, is in this first quarter. Nobody wants a pandemic, but again, you have to look at it from a uh, a situational standpoint, right? What's happening? So, um, to answer your question, I think desanitizing wipes. I think there's still going to be issues with fruits and vegetables. Um, I think uh, the other stuff you should be able to get for back to school. Um, another problem that could occur is, is clothing. Um, I hate to say this, but because of these bankruptcies, um, there could be a situation that that's going on within the supply chain. The other issues we're seeing is that um, the people that are actually making the clothing are taking some huge hits. So, you know, impoverished countries, um, countries that maybe don't have the cash flow to survive, that could be a situation that may pop up. So I guess if you can maybe start trying to buy clothes <laughs> somewhere in June and July for your, for your children to make sure that they're all set for back to school. Oh, no, you're going to set up panic buying for back to school shopping, Pat. <laughs> yeah, I didn't want to do that. No. <laughs> so this is a, I think this is a great question from Nish. Um, he wants to know, you know, one of the things that's happening as a result of COVID-19 is that we really haven't heard the term supply chain all that often in, in the mainstream media. It's not something you hear every day. And so now it is something that we're talking about. And he's wondering what you think the long term impact of that will be on the supply chain profession. Yeah, I think it's going to be actually great. Yeah, and I agree with you, Nish. So this is one thing I keep hearing more of is, is I've never heard the word supply chain used so much in, in the media. And so, you know, we're seeing more of that. And I think that actually will help us, you know, attract even better people, you know, to the profession because we've got some amazing people in the United States. This is the one thing that I, I do want to state is that uh, the supply chain professionals in the United States are some of the best and they're very good at dealing with problems. And so that's what's nice. Our supply chain is stressed, but because we have these great people, it's allowing us to get product. It's allowing us to, you know, to be able to uh, survive. And, and that's really kind of key. So Nish, I think this is actually going to be a great benefit. Uh, you know, if, if there's any uh, silver linings to this, this horrible cloud, that would be one is that I think people will be more attracted to coming into this profession. All right. And I think we have time maybe for one more question. I'm going to grab um, this one from Hillary Officer. She's saying, thinking more proactively, what can we do to make our supply chains of medical products more resilient for when the next crisis occurs? Yeah, that's a great question, Hillary. I think uh, what has to happen really is we need to produce more of that stuff here domestically. I think that's probably the one way that you can protect um, against situations that happen. When you, you know, I, and again, I'm a globalist. I do believe that you, you have to source 
throughout the world. But I do think there's some things that really we should be producing here in this country just to protect ourselves in these situations when pandemics uh, pandemics hit. And I think some of the pharma stuff, some of the medical device stuff that we make outside of this country may want to come back or they may want to think about how do we produce it here? Because I think that's um, that's a real big uh, security concern for the United States. And if we have the ability to do that, I think that's going to help us in these particular situations. So I think some of the stuff should come back. Uh, and I think what the US government could do is maybe incentivize these companies to make that happen. That uh, this has been great, uh, Professor Penfield. I, I really appreciate it. I, I learned a lot. That's not that's not saying much because I started a low bar, but I really uh, I really appreciate you taking the time and sharing this stuff. It was it was uh, super informative and just uh, speaking of just in time, it feels like it's it's so important to understand this stuff. And and I thank you so much to to so many of our friends of Whitman uh, who joined us. This is um, this is something we're going to kind of keep trying to do is share some things about the school and about what's going on with us, but also that that we feel would be relevant uh, for you in, in your lives and your work. So we do have another one planned. We'll be, um, you'll be seeing a, an announcement email or on social for a, a small panel discussion we're gonna, we're gonna do next week uh, with uh, some faculty, some, some of our finance faculty uh, from the Whitman School and some policy folks from the Maxwell School. So we're kind of taking the best of both worlds here. Um, but we really appreciate you participating today and the great questions. Sorry we couldn't get to them all. We want to respect your your time here. And uh, like I said, hopefully you can you can jump on for for uh, with the details we're going to share out pretty soon. But for for our panel discussion next week with with the Maxwell School as well. Thank you to Carrie Howell for all your hard work in pulling this together and making this happen. And Mike Cameron, who's the the mastermind behind the scenes here uh, on the tech side. So we appreciate all that. And thanks, thanks again for joining us, folks. Hope you have a great rest of your Wednesday. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye-bye.